unlike earlier versions of Small Business Server, the migration tool was actually an, an additional thing you had, to, you had to talk to the IT people to help you with or the like. Now this is actually included in there with it. Um, depending upon how clean your original, excuse me, your original configuration was, your mileage may vary on how effective that is. But so the migration from another SBS to a new SBS is kind of automatically built in. A couple other things that have changed. Some of this is because it's Windows 2008 R2, but and let's talk a little bit about what this means from an end user standpoint. Remote web access. What that means is that if you have a small business server 2011 at your office, you have the ability to set it up so that your users, by logging into a website that is run by that server, can take a look at the SharePoint site. They can also get their email, add and send and receive and all that fun stuff. And they can also remotely connect to their desktop. So they can run applications on their desktop at their office even though they're at home. Okay, that's all built in there. Now, wasn't that mostly part of 2008 also? Yeah, it's cleaner, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's in there. Um, the internal websites uh, are redesigned, which is actually kind of how you get to these things. Uh, also, you can automatically manage your domain name. Not sure that's that huge of a deal, but there are some folks that we ran into a couple instances over the past year or so where companies thought their domain name was actually okay and secure and properly managed. We ran into one, we had one client, when we came on board, the, the IT folks who were supporting them prior to us, they registered the domain name through another third party. That third party was a reseller for somebody else. This guy registered the domain name in his name, his businesses. So you had a jump from the client to an IT provider to somebody else and he legally owned the domain name of the company, even though the only reason he registered it was because he was paid by these guys, and the only reason they did it was because they were paid by these guys. Okay, and legally, it would have been a pain in the butt. This guy, and you're keeping track, this guy went out of business, all right? Stopped returning phone calls. We literally offered him money if he would just you know, give up control of the website, it took a year to get this resolved. Okay? And, you know, and it is just one of those things where people don't realize that stuff happens. Now, and the, the simplest thing to do is just to make sure that your organization is named, you know, that you've got the keys to that kingdom. Even if you're going through an IT organization to do this, they should still hand you the keys to this at the end of the day. Okay? And this is a tool that Microsoft is getting into a lot more with all of their core products, Exchange, SQL, Windows Server, so on and so forth. And that is the best practice analyzer. That's a tool that'll literally just run on the network and it'll say, is this the best way it should be set up? Now, best practices are not necessarily the way that everything should be done. Well, why wouldn't they? In some cases, these could be for security settings, these could be for internal or external resource settings, these could be for whatever. Now, in some cases, you may not want certain features activated because you don't want access allowed on this level or at that level. Or, because of another client's need, there may be some level of access that you need that's a little bit more than what their best practice are. So, just because something comes back and says you should go left instead of right, there may be explanations, and the explanations may be legitimate. Also, and this is true especially in older uh, networks, it may have come that way. In other words, somebody said it that way, somebody configured it that way some time ago, and it's been that way ever since, and it's working, and it may not be the best practice, but it's working okay, so. Now, if you've had any experience with a uh, small business server, you also know there's a lot of use of SQL, SQL being the database uh, uh, program. Well, you remember that there was a SQL Express that's included in, in standard. Yeah, that's pretty much a, a small database app 
you can do for small applications and the like, but it doesn't give you the full abilities, uh, controls, and all that fun stuff that SQL Server itself does. So up till 2008, you could get what was called premium. And all premium did was it said you can also install SQL Server on the same box. Now, to the geeks, this would give us a single server that was running Windows as a domain controller, probably DNS, probably DHCP, Exchange. Now we're going to throw SQL on it. This is not going to end well from a performance standpoint. Okay. So what they did with 2008 is they said, well, what we're going to do is now we're going to break it off. So if you go with premium, and now they're calling it a premium add-on, the premium add-on will actually give you an additional server license for Windows and a license for SQL. So this would, getting back to your hardware point, you now need a second computer, a second set of hardware, unless you're virtualizing. We'll talk about that a little bit. But that second computer can be on that small business server domain, and you can use it for SQL, or you can use it for Hyper-V, or remote desktop, or anything else, any other role that you want to use it for. Okay? Why are you stuck that way, buying a second box? Because overwhelmingly, with the exception of small databases, adding this to an SBS box, performance is going to take a is going to take a dump, pure and simple. Now, can you install this on the old, on the? Yes, you can, but uh, I would not. Okay, so you have the standard, which has the other stuff, and then you can add this add-on, the premium add-on, which will include a second license of Windows and a second or, and a, a license of SQL Server standard. Okay, any questions? Pricing. Now, I haven't talked too much about essentials. We'll talk about that in a minute. SBS essentials. That is essentially, <laughs> that's, a, see, that's a Windows server. It's a little trimmed down in terms of what you can do. No exchange. And it can handle up to 25 connections. 25 co computers can connect to it. You can do the file and print. You can do applications on it. You can do all that good stuff. No SQL, no exchange. It will all, but no CALs either. So you can have up to 25 computers connecting to this server without any additional cost. No email. So why, are, why is there no email? Who are they, who are they gunning after? What's that? You got it. You got it. The cloud is it. So for a company that's looking there saying, you know, we're, we're getting our email from the cloud, of course, Microsoft BPOS, because you'd never do Google. <coughs> anyway, um, whether you do it through Google or you do it through uh, Microsoft BPOS, so you're handling the email from the cloud, this takes care of all of the desktop stuff. This will also back up all of the up to 25 desktops to your server. So it's also help you control all the security, all that good stuff. So this, I think, is going to be really cool for smaller companies that can use uh, email hosted. This one's going to be slick, especially 72 bucks a cal. 72 bucks a cal is roughly six bucks a month for a cow. Now, six bucks a month for one year, and then it's, it's paid for, relatively speaking. BPOS, hosted exchange, email only, is five bucks a month. So, for the first year, you're gonna pay 600 bucks more right here, you're going to pay 72 times however many users you've got. You're going to need a bigger server because you've got this exchange application that's going to have to run. You're going to need an anti-spam agent, anti-spam tool in the forefront. 
So more money on the hardware, more money in the software, more money on the CALs versus 495. That's a good question. What's a cal? Because, you know, it's not like I didn't explain it. Wait, I didn't, did I? <laughs> a cal is a client access. I, thank you. Thank you. A, a cal is what's called a client access license. So you bought, a, you bought a computer. That's terrific. But let's start with the server. So you bought a server. So I've got the server sitting here. But this desktop needs to have a license to connect to it. And that's called an access license, a client access license. So if I've got this Windows server sitting right here, and I've got five workstations, I need to have five client access license to connect to it. So in an SBS, we can have up to 75 users, so I might be hit with up to 75 CALs, depending upon the number of users I have. Okay? Now, in a Windows environment, not an SBS environment, if I had a server that's over there and that server's running Exchange, I need to have a CAL to connect to the server and I need to have a CAL to connect to Exchange. So I have two CALs. If I have another server there, that one server CAL, is, that got me in. So I can connect to all the servers in the area. But now that one's running SQL, now I need a SQL CAL. CALs are a pain in the butt. Licensing with Microsoft, pain in the butt and all other parts of the body. Yes. Yes, to a point, okay? There is no straight answer in licensing, okay? And especially if, you're, if, you're, if you come from an accounting world, you're used to two plus two equal four. No. <laughs> okay, <laughs> consultant accounting, what would you like it to be? Okay. Um, what happens is, is if you go out, here's the price for SBS standard, 72 per cal. So if we say, let's, uh, let's say we want 10 cals, so 720 bucks, so we got 1796. Actually, I think this comes with five cals automatically, but just to keep the equation going. So we got about 1800 bucks. Now, that's your software. You can run that till the cows come home. What you don't have is the ability to upgrade to, there will be an SBS 2011 R2 in two years. Or, you know, so there's the cost for upgrading, which can either be a software assurance, uh, there's a couple ways you can get around that, okay? But the bottom line is, if you don't upgrade this software, that is the money that you pay, period, okay? Whereas, in the case of BPOS, or, or even Google as well, those are recurring. So you're gonna pay that five bucks, that 10 bucks, that 60 bucks a year, whatever. You're gonna pay that as long as you're using the service, okay?